please do be seated. And I'm going to read shortly, not just yet, but in a, probably about ten minutes or so, a passage from the Book of Ruth. But I think it's very important that we set the context of why this passage is quite powerful for us as God's people today. We heard earlier that Jesus said the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to us. The apostles wrote that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for our instruction, our edification, and for us as God's people to be able to live fruitful and productive lives. So I'm going to share seven vital and important principles from this passage this morning that are important for us as Christians, no matter how young or how old we are, and also for us as a church in general, as we seek to plot and to plan the future. There are seven simple steps that anybody, even a non-Christian, which through the internet and other places, that I hope people will be listening to this message, that even a non-Christian can take these principles and apply them to a degree and see good things actually happen in their lives. These are the sort of things that the scripture teaches us. But in order for us to truly appreciate them, I need to set the background of why the words Naomi spoke to Ruth have such significance. And so I'll set the introduction, read the reading, and then point out the seven simple steps. Now, there are only two books in the Bible that do not mention the name of God. One of them's not Ruth, but do you know what they are? The Book of Esther and the Song of Songs, they are two books that actually don't mention God. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some of these um, in different books. We'll be looking at Esther at some point. And it's interesting because it was one of the greatest deliverances in Israel's history when a malicious people were trying to destroy and wipe out the covenant people of God. And we see how the hand of God worked invisibly and his name is not even mentioned. Not once in the entire book. And that's because it's teaching us that when we go through things in life that you see all these coincidences that seemingly happen with Esther. And yet we see that they're not coincidences, they're part of God's providence, they're part of his working on behalf of his people. There are only two books in the Bible named after women. One is the book of Esther. And the other is the book of Ruth that we're going to be looking at now. And the book of Ruth is read during the month of May and June in many Jewish communities. They read it out. It's a very important book to them. So the whole book is read out during the months of May and June. It's one of what's called the five scrolls or the five five megalot or megalot, however different people pronounce it different ways. And the five scrolls are the Song of Songs, the Book of Ruth, the Book of Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and the Book of Esther. And they're grouped together because they all tell a similar message, how God's providence works in the lives, everyday lives of his people. And it's important to understand, before we look at this passage, that this was in the days when Judges ruled. And the time of Judges, the Book of Judges, has a fourfold circle you see that God's people constantly refuse to do what he says. They constantly rebel against him and go after other gods and so forth. And then their disobedience leads to oppression. They suddenly wonder, why is everything going wrong for us? Why is life such a disaster? And then they start to realise when God sends them prophets and judges and people to say, this is why it's gone wrong then we see that they start to listen to him or her in their distress. And they finally call out to God and he sends his deliverance. And you look in the book of Judges and you see that there's different characters who God uses greatly. But in the book of Judges, it was a time of great deliverances, angelic visitations, and even some mighty displays of God. Even through Deborah... But why don't these people get their own book? Have you ever thought about that? In the book of Judges, you see these great deliverances like Deborah, a female judge and prophetess. 
that she does not get her own book, even though God used her to help deliver his people from Jabin, an oppressive Canaanite king. So we have to ask the question, why do we suddenly come to a story about an everyday family in particular, a mother-in-law and her mobile daughter-in-law, who herself is a convert to the faith. There's no angelic visitations. There's no great national deliverances. It is literally the story of an ordinary family. Why does that warrant at actually having an entire book written about this story? That's why these things are important, that we understand this. And so the story is that during the time of the judges, when there was a famine, an Israelite family from Bethlehem, Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their sons Malon and Shilion, they emigrated to the nearby country of Moab. And Elimelech dies and the sons married two Moabite women. Malon married Ruth and Chilion married Orpah. And after about ten years, the two sons of Naomi, they die. And so Naomi decided to return to Jerusalem. And she told her daughter-in-laws to return to their own mothers and remarry. So she didn't exactly have some great revelation of God, what he had prepared for Ruth's destiny. It wasn't, no, Ruth's got a destiny, you need to... She didn't. She was making an ordinary day decision based on the information she had, where she said, I think it's best that you both go back to your own countries, your own families, and you try to find somebody to marry there. And Orpah reluctantly left. However, Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you, for wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus and more may the Lord do to me, if anything but death parts me from you. That simple human decision changed human history. That because of it, Ruth meets a husband with whom she has a child. The child is named Obed, who was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Obed became the grandfather of King David, the greatest king in Israel's history. And so Ruth becomes the great-grandmother to the king who changed history. And not only that, she becomes a part of the genealogical ancestry of Christ. Just one everyday decision of what she should do with her life, which way to turn, changed her destiny and changed human history. There are defining moments sometimes in life that can change everything. For us as Christians, the Bible tells us we should pray and seek God's will before we make decisions. That is so important that we do. There's actually a precision to prophecy. There's a risky human element that when you think about it, God chose people he could trust. What if Ruth said, okay, I'm going back to my family? Think about that. What God would have had to come up with another plan. He would have had to have found somebody else to do what he calls us to do. And if you say, well, that's not how God works, actually, it is in the Bible. When you look at it, when God calls people and they say no, he'll find somebody else to do what he wants to do. We see that principle time and time throughout Scripture. And we also see that he could trust Naomi and Boaz. Can he trust us to fulfil the Great Commission? I think the answer to that question is yes or else we would not be here today that we're seeking to do it as forward as we may be as people but the two women returned to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest and in order to support her mother-in-law and herself Ruth went to the field to glean and as it happened the field she went to belonged to a man named Boaz who was kind to her because he had heard of her loyalty to her mother-in-law and Ruth told Naomi of Boaz's kindness and she gleaned in this field through the remainder of barley and wheat harvest. And again, think about it. What is so important about an impoverished woman just going to work in a field scavenging to get some food? 
again, it's not one of these great, seemingly life-changing or human history-changing moments, is it? There's no angels there. There's no trumpets blasting from heaven. No great prophet standing up preaching. No great judge trying to lead the people. Just an ordinary woman, basically, trying to get by. Boaz was a close relative of Naomi's husband's family, and so he was therefore obliged by the Leverite law to marry Malan's widow, Ruth, in order to carry on his family's inheritance. So this is important because there were two men who were required by God's word and God's law that he'd given to his people to marry this woman, Ruth. So what did she do about it? Did she say, I'll wait for God to act. He will surely speak to Boaz. And Boaz will come to me and say, Ruth, God spoken to me, you're to be my wife. Listen to what they did. Listen to what Ruth and her mother-in-law did. I'm reading from Ruth chapter 3 from verse 1. One day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you? where you will be well provided for. Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing, threshing, threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In, in the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow towns will know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. That would be good for your confidence, wouldn't it? That's right, if he wants you, don't worry about it. Let him have you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognised. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. And when Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her everything Boaz had done for her, and added, he gave me six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. The seven principles that could change anybody's lives is know, what, know exactly what you're going after but go after the right things that Ruth was not looking for any man she wanted Boaz and she planned to get him she had a specific goal and I think that's so important that in life so many times we can just rumble on just hoping that something happens but I see Lord that your word says this blessing should be mine. I see it was Ruth's right that one of these two men would actually offer her the hand of marriage and security and all else that would have brought in that day and age. 
But she didn't just wait for God to throw it into her lap. She went after it. She started to pursue it. She started to say, I can see what is my right under God's covenant for me to have. And they came up with a plan, she and her mother-in-law, which is a bit scheming when you look at it. When you actually look at it, there's a lot of scheming there. They come up with this plan to really go after this man, Boaz. Jesus said, a lot of people don't receive because they never ask. He said, if you ask, he said, you will receive. That's one of the secrets of the kingdom of God that Jesus taught us. Now, it's very important, though, to not go after the things that God gives other people. Only go after the things that you are meant to have. God speaks about coveting things that belong to our neighbour, and this can happen in every area of life, that God has blessed that person with this or that. I want that. Well, actually, if you cover what other people want, you'll miss the blessing that God wants to bring in your lives. As a minister, I am content to minister in any situation where God puts me. I'm content to minister here because I know that God has called me to write books and do other things. I've had big ministry in the past, but tell me, let me tell you, with ministries like that, there come big battles, spiritual battles. If I started to look for another man or woman's ministry and say, I wanted that, well, maybe I'm not equipped to fight the spiritual battles they have to fight. People who look at my ministry say, well, we wish God could, could have used us to travel the world and do these things. Or maybe they weren't ready to be able to fight some of the spiritual battles I've had to go through. Know what you're going after, but go after the right things. That we as a church, we need to know, we need to have a plan, which we do, and we need to pursue it. Not just say, God, if you want us to have it, we're going to wait for it, you need to give it to us. We have to act. Step two is have a plan. That God has a blessing, blessing and place for you. When God has a promise for you, go after it at all costs. Naomi had a plan and she said to Ruth, this is what you must do. And so what was Ruth going after? She was going after the promises that was her right by God's word. In life, we have to be clear about our direction. I wake up every day with an agenda. I don't sit around in life waiting for something to happen. I want to make things happen. These things God has called me to do. Write the books, I have to make it happen. You can't write them for me. Somebody else can't write them for me. I have to do it. There's things in your life that God wants you to do. You have to do it. You can't expect somebody else to do the things that God calls you to do. Years of mediocrity is what makes people cynical, bitter and jealous. Step three, be prepared. Ruth had to get herself ready. She was told, wash your face, anoint your face, put some perfume on, change your garments. What would Boaz's reaction have been if when he woke up, the woman lying at his feet was dirt stained from the fields, stinking of sweat where she'd been gathering barley all day, in her dirty work clothes? He might not have been that impressed. She had to prepare herself. And in life, to be able to get the things God wants us to do, we have to prepare ourselves. We have to wash the past off of us. We cannot go forward in life until we rid ourselves of the dirt of the past. That's why the Bible tells us that Christ cleanses us from the dirt of the past. That every morning is a new morning with God. God doesn't care what we were in the past, but he cares about what we are becoming. Wash the past of ourselves. Walk in God's anointing. Put on a fresh attitude of expectation and hope where we expect to see great things happen. Because unless we as God's people change our attitude, we will never rise to the right altitude. Think about that. That's a quote from the Isaiah. It's says about flying with eagles. Unless we change our attitude, we won't get to the altitude where we're supposed to be as Christians. Change your garments, Naomi said to her. 
prepare for what God has for you. And I'll say this, a prepared person in a prepared place will be blessed by God. So Naomi sent Ruth to the threshing floor at night and told her to go where Boaz slept. The fourth thing is, be in the right place at the right time and be prepared to wait. Naomi said to Ruth, just wait there. Don't wake him up. Just wait there. When he wakes up, he will tell you what to do. There are times when if we seek God's will and ask for his will and have a plan, even if we're prepared and ready, there are times when we don't need to panic if we have to wait a bit. Say, okay, Lord, I've got a plan. I'm in the right place with you. I'm prepared to do these things you've called us to do. Now we're going to wait for the right time. The fifth thing, I'm going through these and just giving you the outline because of the limitations of time we have this morning. So step five, be willing to take advice from those who might have more knowledge than you on a particular issue. As she said to Ruth, he will tell you what to do. And Naomi herself was actually giving her advice. Ruth was receiving advice from both her mother-in-law and soon from Boaz what she needed to do. Do not take advice from me if you want to learn how to rewire your house. You will get electrocuted. I guarantee you that 100%. If you say, Sean, give me advice on how to electrocute my, uh, to rewire my house. I don't know, just take the pointy thing, stick it in the pluggy thing and see what happens. You know the point I'm making. We need to listen to people who may have expertise in a particular area. And I would say to you, do listen to me if you want to learn how to walk in step with God and see him work great things in your life. Because this is what God has called me to do. To teach people the secrets of the kingdom of God to be able to proclaim the gospel. Listen to those who have the expertise in an area where you do not, whatever it is you want to do. If people want to study for a mathematics degree, you need to listen to people who have the knowledge of mathematics and so forth. Step six, when it is time to put your plan into action, get on with it despite the risks. Ruth had to go down the threshing floor, and have you thought how risky this was for her? Boaz was a wealthy landowner. She was a penniless foreigner. He could have mocked her. He could have woken up, get out, what are you doing here? My goodness, you're a penniless foreigner, I want nothing to do with you. He could have mocked her. He could have humiliated her. He could have taken sexual advantage of her and then malign her in the morning. Well, she's acted like a prostitute. She came like a prostitute to my feet at night time. Ruth actually had to take risks. She knew who she was, where she had to go, what she had to do, and she was prepared for it, but she still took the risk, not knowing exactly the outcome of the situation. I've seen too many Christians who are terrified of ever taking risks. We as Christians, we need to be prepared to be able to step out and take risks. We've done that as a church with the Rivers of Life shop. We've done it as a church with other things. And I trust we will do it as a church in the future. We don't want to be Christians sailing with Kenf- Captain Comfort on board the HMS only calm waters for us or else we'll never ever leave port. Final step. When the opportunity comes take it. When he finally woke up and spoke to Ruth, she took the opportunity when he said, this is what I'm going to to do. So there are those seven steps that, if we apply them, I guarantee you they make a huge difference. Know what you're going after, but go after the right thing. Have a plan. Be prepared. Be in the right um, be in the right place at the right time and be prepared to wait. Be willing to take advice from those who might have more knowledge on a particular issue. When it's time to put your plan into action, get on with it, despite the risks. And finally, when the opportunity does come, 
take it and enjoy it. These are the secrets of the kingdom of God, how we can fulfil our destinies as his people. Ruth, a convert to the faith, had her life and her destiny changed just by applying those seven principles that we see in the word of God. May we do the same. Lord, help us understand just how all scripture is given to us for our edification, for our instruction, and for the building up of our faith and your church. Help us, Lord, to take these seven principles and may we see our lives and destinies changed and fulfilled as we seek to walk in your purpose. In the name of Christ, amen.